All right, Alexander, we, uh, we just finished with Putin's speech and uh, the ceremony for the four new regions to enter the Russian Federation. Quite a speech. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, it was extraordinarily... Uh, well, first of all, I should say Putin himself looked in a good mood. That was the first thing I would say, and pretty much in control. And that the mood overall came across to me as confident and pretty festive. And I want to say that because we're going to discuss the situation on the ground in Ukraine in a, you know, later in this video. But briefly, confident, strong speech, but to my mind, the final conclusive end of the engagement between Russia and the West, at least for the foreseeable future. I mean, he, right, he's taking the four regions into Russia. Uh, um, so they're now part of Russia. I mean, as of this moment in time, as far as I'm concerned, they're part of Russia. We'd already been told earlier today, Mike Peskov, Putin's spokesman, that an attack on these four regions would be construed as an act of aggression against Russia. I don't think we any, any of us had any doubts about this. And... Um, Putin essentially said the same thing. Actually, he went even further. He said that he would defend these regions with all available means. Now, all available means actually does include nuclear weapons. I don't think that's uh, a threat to Ukraine. I think that's a warning to the West. So I think that's the first thing to say. The second, the second uh, thing that he said, and I'm not talking specifically about the Ukraine conflict, is yes, we're still prepared to negotiate with Ukraine, but it will only be on the basis that Ukraine accepts the fact that these four regions are now part of Russia. I mean, other than that, there really isn't anything. Uh, if, if, if the Ukrainians start bringing up the topic of these regions, and of course Crimea, then, I mean, you know, that's not, not, no longer a topic for discussion. So that's what he said about Ukraine, but he said so much more, and it was so much more interesting. I mean, basically, well, first of all, he specifically identified the Anglo-Saxons as the people who'd carried out the attack on Nord Street, on the Nord Stream pipelines. As the first political leader, that's the first head of state of any country to make such a straightforward allegation. And he's now come out and openly said it was the United States, essentially, and Britain. I mean, the United States principally. Um, he also accused the Western powers of acting as colonizers, of trying to subjugate Russia in the 1990s, of stripping it with its resources, um, treating Russia as a colony. Um, he makes it absolutely crystal clear that he regards the Western powers no longer as partners, but essentially as predatory enemies. <laughs> and I can't for the life of me see after this how there is any going back. There is no possibility of any kind of reconciliation between Russia and the West, certainly while Putin remains president. But given that Putin is undoubtedly articulating the opinions of most of the Russian leadership and the great majority of the Russian people, I think we can say as of now, as of this moment, that the West has lost Russia. I mean, it lost China back in the 40s and that triggered a massive debate in the West. It's now lost Russia. Perhaps that will also one day trigger a debate in the West. But the fact is that any chance of any sort of reconciliation is once and forever gone. Okay, well, uh, let's go back to what he said about Ukraine, and then we'll talk about what he said about the collective West. Um, he said that the people made their choice in these regions. They made their choice. They want to be part of Russia. It's over. It's, it's done with. And then he called on, uh, on Kiev to negotiate for a ceasefire one last time. I'm paraphrasing kind of what he said, but he was basically, one last time, negotiate for a ceasefire. But these regions, Crimea, it's, they're off the, off the table. Uh, that's not going to happen if you go by the statements, not only from Alensky, but go by the statements of his, of his puppet uh, masters, the people that are pulling the strings. You can start with 
Joe Biden, if if you want to say that Biden is pulling the strings of, of Zelensky. But anyway, he came out with a statement yesterday and he said that the U.S. will never recognize these four republics. So, I mean, when Putin says, let's negotiate in his speech, these four regions are done. They're part of Russia, but let's negotiate with this new reality. He knows that they're not going to accept this offer, correct? Correct. Absolutely. Of course, he knows that. I mean, he's under no doubt about that. I mean, it... He's not naive. Every other part of why make the offer? What will one make the offer? The reason he makes the offer is, I think, that he again wants to show both to the Russian people, but also most importantly to his various international allies. He spoke to Erdogan yesterday, for example, uh, a long and apparently friendly call um, that um, you know he's not ruling out peace. It's not he who's ruling out peace. It works to his advantage always to appear as the person who's willing to engage Ukraine in negotiations. If Ukraine rules out negotiations, then it helps him. It, it means that it's Ukraine that is the intransigent party, and that's the way in which he wants to paint them. And that's what's going to happen. And by the way, world opinion agrees with him. World opinion knows perfectly well, and I, when I say world opinion, I mean opinion of the world outside the West. They know perfectly well the diplomatic history. They know all about the Minsk agreements, the first Minsk agreement and the second Minsk agreement and the agreements that were made in February 2014 prior to the Maidan event, all of which were broken. They know all about, they know the whole history. They know about the Istanbul agreement that was almost agreed in March. Um, So Putin coming forward and saying, look, it's Ukraine It is Western puppet masters. I think he used those very words, by the way. I think he actually called them puppet masters. Uh, uh, um, You know, it's the West. They are the people who are absolutely implacable. They are the people who won't sit down and talk. Well, it, 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 it makes him appear reasonable and it makes the other side appear unreasonable. It's the tactic of a lawyer. And it's the tactic that another lawyer, who was also the president of a country at war, used. And that was, of course, Abraham Lincoln during the American Civil War, when he also repeatedly said that he was willing to sit down and negotiate with the other side, knowing perfectly well that they would never do so. Okay. Uh, If anyone wants to understand why the collective West hates Putin so much, all they have to do is listen to this speech. I've never heard a leader speak like this about the collective West. Um, Once again, Putin went back in history. He talked about uh, the United States using uh, uh, nuclear weapons, an atomic bomb on Japan twice. He talked about Dresden and what they did there. He talked about occupying Germany. He talked about uh, Korea. He talked about uh, the colonization of so many countries. He mentioned India. Um, he talked about the pillaging, the plundering, the blackmailing, the lying. Uh, he, he specifically called out the Anglo-Saxons. He, I mean, he said that through his speech. How is the European Union, the United States, the collective West going to receive this speech? I mean... It's one thing for world leaders outside of the collective West to think these things, to perhaps whisper these things to their, to their foreign ministers, to their defense ministers, to their colleagues. But it's another thing to hear these things being said out loud at such an event. Absolutely. Now, of course, Can most I... people are never going to get the full speech. But yeah. I just want to say most people are never going to get the full speech of Putin for a reason in the collective West, they're not going to, I'm sure they're going to pick pieces and parts of the speech and, and demonize Putin by uh, singling out pieces and parts of the speech. But uh, taken as a whole, when you listen to what he said, it, it, you know, this was pretty, uh, pretty heavy stuff that he was throwing it was out co- there. It was coruscating stuff. Now, can I just say, I mean, there's, there's, there's three audiences. First of all, there's the Russians who obviously are interested in this. And I mean, I'm sure it will get a lot of traction there. You're talking about the non-Western world. I think they're going to read this speech. A lot of them are going to hear this with a certain degree of admiration. 
Because as you absolutely rightly say, it's what they all think. The Chinese think this, the Indians think this, the people in Africa think this. They've all experienced what the West has done. It's a fact people don't always realise. But you only have to spend any amount of time with people from these countries to know that they are very familiar with their colonial histories, their colonial pasts. And as I said, here's somebody, a world leader, coming out and saying openly what well, all of them are frightened or intimidated from saying openly. So there's going to be a, a, you know, a certain amount of admiration for this, even if they're still too nervous to join him and say it themselves. Um, but, you know, that's an important thing to say. And I think in the non-Western world, this speech will be read and listened to and studied carefully. What will the Western powers think? They will be furious. They will be absolutely livid. They will be so angry that um, it will make them even more dangerous than they have been up to now. Because, of course, what's happened is that somebody has come along and pointed to the monster and said it's actually a monster. It's not a saint, which is what it pretends to be. And when that happens, um, when the Western powers are confronted with that, well, that, that will make them especially angry. And, by the way, I thought amongst the most interesting things was his comments about the British. I mean, you know, specifically, it wasn't the British, but, you know, calling, talk, calling out the history of colonisation and imperialism and all those things. I, I would make a point which many people who watch us outside Britain may not be aware of, but the subject of colonisation, of imperialism, is barely discussed in Britain today. It's a dirty secret, if you like, which we really don't want to address. Very, very few people in Britain have been have discussed what has happened, what happened in Britain's colonies. And um, very few people um, in Britain are prepared to accept some of the terrible things that the British did in those colonies. So, you know, it, it is go the British elite, who of course know it, know all that, are going to be especially angry as a result of this speech. And, you know, mentioning Dresden okay, so as well. Hmm. It was who, who did who did dress and it was the British it, <laughs> point to remember um, he made fun in a way I mean he was making fun at, at, at the weakness at the submissiveness of the of the western leaders I mean it was it was clear that he was saying that you guys are a bunch of, of puppets you have no no uh, no self-respect no sovereignty you're submissive I mean it, that is what he was saying about Western leaders. So he knows all of this. He knows that they're going to take this and they're going to absolutely become furious. I mean, we thought they wanted regime change before in Russia. You know, multiply that by 100x. He knows all of this. Yeah. What, what next? Well, what indeed, what next? By the way, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, the one thing weak leaders don't like, are particularly angry when it's pointed out, is that they are weak. They know themselves that they are weak. They know how weak they are. They know how submissive and servile they are. And, of course, they take out the anger that that causes them, partly upon their adversaries, e.g. Putin who is obviously not weak, but to a great extent also, and we mustn't overlook this upon their own people, and that's something we're going to have to prepare for. But what it means is what, what, what this speech makes, as you're going to say, they're going to try to redouble their regime change efforts, and that's going to be very, very difficult because, of course, having pulled out most of their people from Russia, they don't really have the agents any longer in place to carry out regime change in Russia, at least not in the way that they did. But they're going to make, they're going to redouble their efforts now, or so it seems to me, to place Russia under some kind of economic siege, 
I mean, that's the only thing, it seems to me, realistically, they can do. We, we, we may get more acts of sabotage. We may get attempts to blow up pipelines in Siberia, perhaps go from Siberia to China. Who knows? We may be seeing more of that. We may be seeing more harassment of Russians around the world. But ultimately and overall, there will be now incredible pressure from the West on all the uh, non-aligned global South countries to um, try and sever economic links with Russia, because this is this this utters this this speech said so many taboo things that they just can't uh, they can't um, accept that. And what that inevitably means now is that there's going to be a massive um, conflict. A new, a renewed struggle around the world for political influence, because China isn't going to drop Russia. Russia is too important to China for China to drop Russia. And besides, they agree with what Putin has said anyway. And there was a very interesting editorial in Global Times yesterday, which also basically pointed at the US as being responsible for the Nord Stream explosions. So what's now going to happen is that you're going to start to see the world divide increasingly into camps. You're going to see a renewed Cold War, but with an intensity and an anger and a hate that we didn't see during the first Cold War. And that's, I think, something people perhaps need to understand. OK, let me read you some more uh, excerpts. You can comment, and then we'll talk about what's going on on the ground. Uh, Putin called the rules-based order proposed by the West quote, nonsense. He said Western elites has, have always been and remained colonizers. When talking about what happened with the Nord Stream pipelines, he said the Anglo-Saxons, they switched to sabotage, actually destroying pan-European infrastructure. He said that the United States is trying to take everything um, impundently and blackmail, lying recklessly like Goebbels. He then said, the West denies moral standards, religion, family. He says, does, uh, do Russians really want to have parent number one, two, three, instead of mom and dad? That's going to infuriate them. That is going to infuriate the collective West. Um, he talked about the whole gender thing in the collective West. He says there are uh, supposedly there are some genders except for women and men. For us, this is unacceptable. That is going to infuriate them. And finally, um, what I believe is actually perhaps one of the most important lines that he said, which sums up where we are heading in the world today. He said, paper money like the dollar and the euro, it cannot feed people. And then he talked about the money printing and everything like that. I think that is actually, out of everything he said, yeah. I think that line right there is probably the most important yes. um, line of his speech. Yes, because he points to the basic economic truth of the last 30 years, or 50 years if you'd like, and also to the underlying weakness of the Western system, because it is ultimately now based on money creation, artificial money creation. Um, um, central banks, finance ministries simply creating money out of thin air, uh, money that is increasingly not backed by goods. And that's the problem. That's why we have a worldwide inflation problem, why that worldwide inflation problem is going to get worse, uh, as we've discussed in several programs. And, um, and he's absolutely right. And of course, when he talks about that, he also signals to his greatest adversary that he knows what their weakness is, and that's going to make them even more angry. And that's a point to bear in mind, because they know that what he says about this is true. That will make them frightened, and frightened people become extremely angry, and anger makes them even more dangerous. So, you know, this is a this is a extraordinary speech in many respects. Um, and just to, by the way, go back to all those points about the family and all those things that he was talking about. 
obviously that appeal appeals massively to opinion around the world outside the West. But it's also clear, I think, that he was making a pitch to conservative opinion in Europe. I mean, he hasn't completely given up on it. And I mean, when he talks about attacks on European energy infrastructure, sabotage of energy infrastructure, all of these attempts to change people's um, um, social behaviour in this kind of way. I mean, it appeals to he, he's he's making a pitch to conservative opinion, first and foremost in Europe, but also, I suspect, ultimately, to some extent in the United States, too. So. It's an extraordinary speech, but it's also a very dangerous speech, or rather not a dangerous speech as such, but a speech that tells us that we are entering into very dangerous times, because this is essentially a call to battle. It's a call to battle against the West. Um, it says Russia is doing its bit. It's also inviting others, in effect, to join that battle too. And they will, because that battle is now joined. I mean, all the pretenses, all the point about partners, all these attempts to get on with people, all those meetings with Merkel, when we knew that deep down they both despised each other, but they went through the motions of appearing to get on with each other. All that's now history. It's now straightforward, open competition, conflict between two power blocks, Putin has taken this further than the other Eurasian states have, but there's no doubt at all that most of the Eurasians quietly agree with him. Yeah, he actually said in his speech that uh, they're trying to contain Russia, but they're, next, they're going to go after next China, Iran, and other countries. Yeah, absolutely. He, was, he specifically yeah. stated that. Yeah. Today it's Russia, tomorrow it's, yeah. it's other countries. So um, what is going on then? in Ukraine from Putin's speech and uh, many of the macro statements that he made in his speech. Let's get to the micro, I guess, and talk about the micro, <laughs> the micro situation. Yeah. Well, the, um, okay. So, I mean, no one's talking about the fighting in and around uh, Bakhmut in these areas yeah. and all the focus, especially from the, from the collective West media. Yeah. Um, maybe rightly so, maybe wrongly so is uh, Krasny Lyman. That I know, the, absolutely. Uh, the big focus. Absolutely. I actually, actually read rumors, just real quick, that uh, uh, Zelensky has, has basically given an order to say, we are going to surround this, uh, this city today or, or nothing. It's all or nothing. It's and all or nothing, exactly. exactly. Moved, uh, yeah. Resources from uh, Seversk yeah. to, to do yeah. that. I mean, this is, yeah. this is a massive, massive push. And, yes. and I just want to say from the Russian analysis or say interwebs telegram channels there are a lot of people uh asking uh where is russia why are yeah. they not doing anything what's what's yeah. going on here so i mean there are those questions there yeah. kind of like what was experienced during uh the hot gulf counter offensive in Absolutely. a way i'm not saying they're exactly yeah. similar yeah. but you see a lot yeah. of the same you know questioning of of, yes. of russian tactics yes can i just say i think that krasny liman has become an obsession for many people. Um, it's become an obsession for many Russian bloggers and Russian um, reporters on the ground. Um, and if you actually go to the media in the West today, Reuters, the Financial Times, the Guardian, the Telegraph, the American media, it's interesting now that they're actually taking their accounts of what's going on in the battle. Even the Institute for the Study of War is taking their account now about what's happening around Krasny Liman from these complaints about Russian inaction from these Russian reporters and bloggers. Now, Krasny Liman in itself is a small place. It was about 15,000 people before the war. Apparently, it's almost completely deserted now. There's a, a certain number of troops there. Apparently, they're not regular army. They're not regular Russian army. They're from the uh, forces of the Donetsk People's Republic, backed by a Kuban Cossack irregular unit made up of volunteers from Russia. The Russian military does have a presence in the area, but it's the usual business. It's they provide artillery and that kind of thing. So you, Zelensky, Ukraine has been desperate to do two things. Firstly, they were desperate 
after the Kharkov counteroffensive or offensive to exploit that, to make some big push into Donetsk and Lugansk region and into northern Donbass. And they had a short time window because in about 10 days' time, the, the, the rains begin, this whole area turns into basically soft, swampy ground, the kind of offensives Ukraine wants to conduct, apparently going to be very difficult. So they had a, tie, a very short time window. Anyway, Lehman stood in their way. It was clearly given an order from Moscow to stand. I mean, there was no retreat from Lehman. That's the most important thing to say about this battle. Up to in other places where the Russians or the Allied forces have been outnumbered, they generally decided to pull back. But Lehman was told to stand. And the reason it was told to stand quite clearly was because other forces were being built up to defend the rest of northern Donbass. And in fact, um, shortly before we started this program, um, I was getting very sketchy and unconfirmed reports that the Russian 58th Guards army is now uh, marching in this direction, presumably to confront the Ukrainian troops in this area and possibly break the siege of Lehman. So uh, this is a small place. The, the, the most interesting thing about it is not, you know, whether its capture would have been a big blow to the Russians. It's not a big blow to the Russians. It's the Obsession, the fixation the Ukrainians have shown in it. They've suffered more and more losses trying to capture it. And instead of rethinking their strategy, they've doubled down. And now they're deploying troops from Sivesk, and perhaps more important place, which they were defending. They've actually taken troops away from the Sivesk defense lines, and they're redeploying them to try to capture Krasny Liman presumably before the 58th Guards Army, the Russian army, gets there. And it, it seems to me that what it shows, again, is the extent to which Ukraine is being driven here by optics more than anything else. They wanted, they, they weren't able, they don't have the time now, it seems to me, to launch this grand offensive into northern Donbass, but they still want to take Liman because they need to show that their offensive is still succeeding, that they're still advancing, even on this day when all these regions are joining Russia. So I think this, this, I mean, this is my own assessment. I mean, I'm not a military person, as I said many times, but this is how it looks to me. And we shouldn't perhaps be overly influenced by some of the very emotional reporting from the people on the ground, from the Russian side, who obviously have friends in Liman defending it. I mean, this town, far from being a strategic point, as some people are saying, it looks to me, frankly, something of a sideshow. Um, Ukraine has failed in Kherson. It's failed in Saporozhye. It's failed near Ugledal, which is this other area in southern Donetsk. It's losing in Bakhmut. So it's thrown everything it has, you know, up to and including the kitchen sink to capture Liman, even beyond the point where Liman itself has perhaps lost whatever significance it had. And um, the result is that there's been a battle there. We'll see whether Liman holds. We'll see whether these Russian reinforcements get there. Um, perhaps they will. Um, in which case, as I said, I think we'll probably forget about this battle very quickly. The big events today haven't happened in Ukraine. They've happened in Moscow. Yeah. OK, so to wrap up the uh, the video, um, the Collective West, they are reporting. Three things and they're leaving out one thing which makes me very, very curious as to why they're not reporting on it. I know why they're not reporting on it, but still, I say that's interesting. And I've gone through the pages of BBC in the morning and CNN, all of them, all the usual suspects. Um, Liban is about to uh, fall, and that's going to be a big blow for Putin. That's the first story. Second story is partial mobilization is a disaster. Thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Russians are fleeing Russia. 
millions are fleeing. That's, that's the narrative. And once again, the, uh, the Russian economy is in tatters. It seems like they're, they're never going to let this go, that the Russian economy is, is falling apart. No. So these are the three stories that they're focused in on. So yeah. talk a little, so, bit, a little bit about those three stories. You talked a little bit about Lehman. Okay. I, I, we understand I, I, why they need it, why they need this story yeah. to happen. And the one story, and just let me finish my question, and the one story they're not talking about is Nord Stream. Which know, is absolutely. very, very, very telling. Because if this was some other type of incident that has happened in the past, whether it was chemical weapons in Syria or MH17 or whatever, I mean, you know, usually they've, they've pointed out who, who the culprit is and they've condemned them within the first 30 minutes and the media is running with it. So uh, talk about these narratives. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, th- I think I said all I could say about Lehman for the moment, but let's talk about the the other ones. Let's talk about partial mobilisation. Firstly, there's no doubt at all that at the be- beginning, as with every big mobilisation process, every big uh, um, every big logistical process, there are teething problems, and there were teething problems. People were called up who shouldn't have been called up. And they've basically mostly been sent back to their homes. Apparently, a few of them have said that they want to continue to serve. So that's a rather strange. Well, that's their decision. They're deeply patriotic people. Some people have left. And by the way, this always happens in every country which mobilizes. I think that's a point to make. I mean, I am old enough to remember the 1960s. When the and uh, early 1970s, and meeting lots of young Americans all over Europe who were fleeing the draft because they didn't want to serve in in Vietnam, and um, there's been many other cases. If you've been following the war in Ukraine, you will know that there are thousands of Ukrainians, not thousands, millions of I think eight million Ukrainians have left Ukraine. Many of them men because they don't want to serve in the Ukrainian military. My impression is, yes, there were some people who didn't want to serve, some people made for the exits. They're not the kind of people, as a matter of fact, that the Russian military wanted. So I don't think this has affected the pace of the mobilisation at all. And my impression is that that process is ebbing anyway, and that the numbers of people involved who fled, well, there might have been several hundred thousand, certainly not millions. I've seen a figure of 300,000 uh, mentioned. Out of a population of 150 million, that's not a significant number. Many of them will come back. Many of them are the sort of people, I suspect, who are not very, um, who are hostile to the Russian government anyway. My own sense is that after a few teething pro- problems, partial mobilization has been relatively successful, new formations are uh, uh, being formed, training systems are taking place, most people who, the vast majority of people who were called up have uh, turned out willingly, you've seen queues of people coming along to uh, accept the call up, and I don't think this is going to be a problem. I think in a few weeks, a few days' time, this whole story will have disappeared about, you know, the collapse of failure of partial mobilisation and all the rest. Now, about the imminent collapse of the West, of the Russian economy, well, what can I say? I was looking at the, I was looking at the figures, not, you know, the, the currency figures today. The ruble has strengthened again. <laughs> it's strengthened against the ruble. It even strengthened against the dollar. That doesn't seem to me to be a sign of a collapsing economy. Um, I think that this is mirror imaging. The fact is there's a massive economic crisis in Europe. It's getting worse by the hour. I'm not going to even start with Britain, where uh, the pound, as I'm talking about, the sterling is again falling and things look really, really desperate. We've just had a disastrous inflation readout in Europe. Things are not good in the United States. So you've got to keep people on board with the sanctions. You've got to tell them, well, actually, we're winning. So, of course, Russia's economy is, in fact, on the brink of collapse. It's a story that is repeated every couple of weeks. It then fades away and then it resumes. But I've been reading what Russian officials have themselves been saying. They seem to be pretty relaxed about the overall situation with their economy. And last but not least, 
the most important thing of all. As you absolutely rightly said, nobody wants to talk about Nord Stream. It's very interesting. It's not the headline. It's never been the headline story. Um, there's been extreme reluctance to discuss what has happened. And I can't help but think that behind the shock and horror, the reason is that everybody knows who was really responsible but they don't want to say. So they have to try and find some way of putting together a convincing narrative that can blame it all on the Russians, and they're finding it very difficult. And they, can. they can't, exactly. I don't think they can spin this one, so no. they'll just let it fizzle away. Yeah. My hunch. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Uh, the Durand.locals.com, Durand shop, 10% off. Use the code, good day. Take care.